my pleasure to be here with you today. I'm going to um, jump right in by starting with a story because I think stories help us a lot. What I want you to do during this story, hold on, my, um, got to change it. This is not set up right now. Let's try it again. Okay, what I want you to do is think about the medical aspect and whether or not there's anything medically that might have been done to intervene in this situation. I'm going to tell you about Jill. Jill was a runaway teenager at 14. She had a sexually and physically abusive situation at home that she was escaping. And she was homeless until she was approached in a suburban mall by a man named Bruce. And Bruce promised to help her um, and provide work for her. So he took her to his office, and his office was the cellar of his home. Um, he hung her up by her wrists from the ceiling with leather straps. He stripped her, beat her, tortured her, until she agreed to work as a prostitute. And that included that he hung her so that she had permanent scarring and damaged her, her vocal cords that uh, affected her speech. So once Jill had agreed to serve as a prostitute, Bruce started bringing clients into his home to have sex with Jill. And some of the clients would pay extra, and then they would get to do what they wanted with Jill. Um, this went on for three years. And she suffered this torture and repeated rape, and she eventually got pregnant. So Bruce decided that she should have an abortion, and he decided that he would do that. And so he tried to do an abortion, but he was unsuccessful at it, and Jill started to hemorrhage. So he had to take her to the hospital at that point. When they got to the hospital, he said that he was her older brother, and she was schizophrenic. And he was trying so hard to take good care of her. In fact, there were uh, notes in the nurse's records about how much they thought Bruce was just wonderful because he was with her constantly. He never left her side. When they, she, they tried to talk to her, he would answer. He would take over. He would try to do all of these things for her. So um, while she was there, they thought because of her schizophrenia, she was hallucinating. And she was saying these strange things like the fact that Bruce was holding her captive. But of course, they knew from Bruce that she was schizophrenic. so. They didn't pay any attention to that. She was in the hospital for three days. She wound up in the operating room for a curatage. Um, she got several units of blood. She got antibiotics to prevent infection. So she got that all in the hospital, but here's what she didn't get. She didn't get a mental health consultation, even though it was said she was schizophrenic. She was never questioned about any of her injuries without Bruce being present. There was no social service consult, and she was ultimately discharged from the hospital without ever having the ability to get free from her captor, even though here was an opportunity. So this continued, and Bruce moved around quite a bit so that they were less likely to get caught. And they were actually down in Arizona, and they stopped at a truck stop, and he told her to go in to get, I have to change this to Coke, because I know that's one of your sponsors, right? Um, he t told her to go in to get a Coke, and she was really dehydrated and um, tired, and she fainted on the steps of the uh, truck stop. So the truck stop people called the paramedics uh, to come, and again, Bruce said that he was her older brother. When the paramedics got there on their physical exam, what they found was someone who was dirty from head to toe, she had sores on her ankles and her wrists from being bound. The corners of her mouth were bruised from wearing a gag for several days. And they treated her for her hydration, and then they left. Interestingly, while that was going on, he tied her up again, and he put her back into the truck. A man and a woman were at the same truck stop in a Cadillac, and they saw her being tied up and put back in the truck. But they didn't want to get involved, so they didn't do anything. And the only reason she was able to escape was that Bruce was arrested on other charges. And um, when that happened, the police went to 
his home to look for evidence, and they found her locked in a closet, bound and gagged, and blindfolded. And that's how Jill finally escaped. And Jill's story all happened before she reached the age of 18. So this is a kind of story about the human slavery that goes on today. And I think when we hear about slavery in this country, we think about um, the fact that, well, slavery ended in 1865. That's when the Civil War was over, and we don't have any more slavery. Actually, slavery had gone on for 400 years before the Civil War happened. And in 400 years, there were a total of 9 million slaves over that 400 years. Today, in this world, there's someone, somewhere between 21 and 27 million slaves just today. So it's certainly not something that's gotten any better. There's two categories of human trafficking. Um, one is labor trafficking. I'm sorry, that didn't sh did that show up yet? Yes, the labor trafficking that you see, um, you'll find domestic uh, servants working in houses that are uh, virtual prisoners there, sweatshops, um, brick kilns, lots of areas of labor. The fishing industry in Asia has a lot of uh, labor traffic people. And sex trafficking, and that's the area that most of my work has been in. And these are the types of things that you see in that area. There's other kinds of trafficking too. For example, um, in Syria today, you know about the terrible violence and the fighting that's going on there. Um, some moms will look at their kids and they'll know that there's not very much chance they're going to survive say, staying where they are in Syria. So they will put them in a boat and they'll send them across to Greece because Greece has a lot of coastline and a lot of places you can sneak into a country and they figure at least they'll have a chance if they can get away. And then when they get there, if a trafficker finds them, they'll take them and they'll use them for organ transplants. They'll take an eye from them or they'll take a kidney from them or they'll take two kidneys from them or they'll take two eyes from them. So you can traffic many, many different things. Um, it's thought today in the United States that nine and a half billion dollars a year is in the trafficking industry. And in the world, it's thought that it's a $32 billion industry, which is only secondary to the drug um, industry. And why is this such a huge problem? Because it translates into money. And so besides just ma and pa organizations, now you run into mafias and big organizations that are getting involved. Because for example, if I'm selling drugs and I sell you my drugs, I sell you my product, and it's gone. I have to get some more product to sell. But I sell you a girl, and then I take her back, and then I can sell her to you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and I sell my product. And I make a lot of money off of that product, much more than I would in drugs. Um, I just put this up to show you that there's two kinds of trafficking. There, countries are either considered a source country, which means that the women and girls come from that country for t to be trafficked, or there's a destination country, and that's the country that they'll go to. For example, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the large unemployment and economic issues, women were told there, we'll get you a job in a restaurant, we'll get you a job as a nanny, um, we'll get you to Canada, we'll get you to the United States, and they get them over here and they lock them in a room and they take their passport and they don't feed them, and they rape them, and they don't know where they are, and they can't speak the language, and they stay there until they agree um, to be prostituted. So the United States is both <coughs> a destination country, people coming from other countries to work here, and a source country. We grow our own people for prostitution. Um, in Minnesota, to bring it home a little more, there's actually a national categories kept A, B, C, D, E, and F of levels of how legislature and work is going to deal with trafficking issues there. Minnesota is considered a C country and <coughs> is considered the 13th largest state for trafficking of children. 
in this country. Um, if you look at the counties, this is a map with counties, every single county in Minnesota has human trafficking found in it. And they come from cities and towns all over the state. It's not just St. Paul, it's not just Duluth, it's Red Lake, it's Pillager, it's Maplewood, it's Mankato. They come from all of these cities. And they also come from lots of states, and they come from Chicago and Las Vegas and Wyoming and all over, and they're here from many, many countries in addition. So you can find this state of Minnesota is both a destination state and a source state. And I think one of the most disturbing statistics about Minnesota is that it's the second in the nation in the online solicitation of children. Those are statistics from the FBI. How do people find these young women? Well, I just pulled this up this week off of uh, Backpage.com on the internet. It's, th it's said by the FBI that there are over 500 ads for trafficked women and girls and boys in the Twin Cities in 24 hours. Just in the Twin Cities. It's not hard to find them. This is just one page. And you can bet when it says 23 or 22 or 21 that they're really probably teenagers because if you are underage, by definition, it's considered trafficking if someone is in prostitution because a teenager is considered coerced and not yet able to make that decision. And in the United States, the most common form of trafficking we have is teenagers. Here, it's a misconception that girls are willing participants in their own exploitation. Juveniles lack the knowledge, maturity, and awareness to understand the consequences of their action and in making such choices. We have a lot of teenagers. If you look in this country, it's thought that there's, it's very, very hard to get statistics in this field, but it's thought that there's between 100,000 and a quarter of a million children in this country that are sexual commodities. The youngest child that I've ever taken care of that's been rescued from trafficking, has already been freed, was five years old. And I have a five-year-old grandson, and I look at him and I think, no, it can't be. It's not possible. But it, it is. That's what's happening. And the next statement, the average age of entry into pornography and prostitution in the United States is age 12. Um, if a teenager is on the street, one out of three are contacted within 48 hours by a trafficker. So what is, you know, how do you wrap your mind around something like that? Well, if you look at domestic minor sex trafficking in the United St States, remember I showed you 100,000 to 230,000 girls. Let's just really dumb that down and say only 50,000, less than 18. That's still 20 times more than the deaths from motor vehicle accidents or 50 times more than the deaths from suicide in this country. So this is a significant health problem to our teens. And where do the traffickers find these girls? Well, like Bruce, they find them in malls, they find them at bus stops. And what's very concerning today, and is the bigger problem in Minnesota, is the internet. It's so important that young people realize the risks they get into in chat rooms and meeting people on the internet. Here's an ad by one of the trafficking groups, Be meet 10-year-old Becky's 12-year-old internet friend. So the internet has really made trafficking widely available. And I put up this list for you because I know not too long ago, many of you were teenagers yourselves, and I don't know if there's anything on that list that you felt applied to you when you were growing up. The at-risk teenager is not just the inner city girl in the ghetto who's being abused at home and chooses to run away. It can be that girl across the street in your neighborhood or that girl who's in your class at school. You can go to Amazon.com and you can buy this book on Pimpology. There's lots of instruction. It's highly rated on Amazon, by the way. There's many books on Amazon that you can find on how to do this and be a trafficker. And who are the traffickers? They're not just these um, you know, slummy guys that you think of. 
um, and make a stereotype, any sort of, um, a pimp is a trafficker, but they can be a boyfriend, it can be a father, it can be a mother, it can be a brother, it can be a coach, it can be a teacher, it can be a pastor, it's anyone who has control over a, over a minor. I've had a woman try to explain to me how she had three children and she made really bad choices in her life and she had no way left, nothing to sell to feed her kids. So the only thing she had left to sell was her daughter. And she sold her daughter. I, I see another little girl in Nicaragua several times a year and she was sold by her mother for $7.60. So how does that help you with your self-esteem and how good you feel about yourself? Traffickers um, in this study, for example, which came out of GEMS in New York just a year and a half ago, um, you could see many times it's immediate family, it's boyfriends, it's not people who just get kidnapped, although that can happen too. I don't know, I look for a younger female, you know, a younger female with a backpack or something, because the first thing I'm going to think is, okay, she, she's leaving home. She's leaving home for a reason. More than likely, she just had, got into it with her parents, or she decides she wants to run away from home. It really doesn't boil down to money. If she ends up with just the money, then, then that's not going to really work out. You see what I'm saying? The girl has to be so love drunk, if you will, off of me to where though she would do anything. I make sure she has what she needs, personal hygiene, you know, take her, get her nails done, take her to buy an outfit, you know, spend time with her, you know, take her out to eat, you know, make, make her feel one, you know, but I don't give her any money. It goes on, but I think you get the idea. Here's a quote, you promise a girl heaven and she'll follow you to hell. Um, that's from another book on trafficking. This one's from The Pimp Game. You start to dress her, think for her, own her. If you and your victim are sexually active, slow it down. After sex, take her shopping for one item. Hair and her nails is fine. She'll develop a feeling of accomplishment. And after you have broken her spirit, she has no sense of self-value. Now, pimp. Put a price tag on the item you've manufactured. So who's the buyers? Who's the Johns that take these girls? Well, again, 40% worked in professions of trust or authority. Um, so they're, they're teachers, they're coaches, they're pastors, they're law enforcement. Many, many women who have been trafficked are very afraid of law enforcement because that has been some of the people that have bought them and that they have worked for. And um, many people are looking for younger children. If you look in, in other countries, for example, a myth in Southeast Asia is that if you have, if you're HIV positive and you have sex with a virgin, your HIV will be cured. So that's a reason that men will go for, you know, six, seven, eight-year-old virginal girls and, and pay more for them. Um, what causes sex trafficking? Well, if it, we could just put a finger on one thing, we could probably fix it. But the problem is you can see that it's multifactorial. All of these things come into play when it comes to trafficking. And we really could spend a whole hour just talking about the causes that come up. What about the impact of trafficking? I like this quote a lot. Sexual trauma is unique from other forms of trauma. It's a violation of the most intimate and personal aspects of the self. One's own body becomes the setting in which the atrocities are perpetrated. And that has a tremendous effect on someone forever. Um, there's lots of ways of recruiting um, for trafficking, some of which we've talked about. There's um, lots of methods of conditioning that are used. Again, we could spend the whole time 
just telling you stories that people have told me about how they've been treated. But we need to spend the rest of our time on the health problems that come up and what you can be doing about that. Here's just some quotes about health. Trafficking harms women in insidious ways that create messy health problems. The physical and mental health consequences are not a side effect of trafficking, but a central theme. And trafficking is a healthcare issue in that healthcare is central to restoring the well-being of the trafficking survivor. Just changing laws and getting more police out working are not going to solve the problem. People in medicine have to be involved. And here's a study that was done in an emergency room department. And they looked at four large emergency rooms in the Northeast. 98% had, had no formal training on trafficking. And hopefully that's changing. That's one of the first things we're trying to do. Um, this is a study that showed that in Los Angeles, women who had been freed from trafficking, half of them had seen healthcare providers while they were in trafficking and none of them had been released because of that. There's a new study from New York in which 87% of people freed from trafficking said they had seen a healthcare provider while they were in captivity. Also, they lack a lot of preventive services. So what you're going to see are more advanced cases of certain problems. For example, it's not likely a pimp's going to say, come on, it's time to get your yearly mammogram. They're just not interested in that. They don't have access to care. Many people have no idea where to go, even if they wanted to, because they don't know where they are, and they're moved around a lot. Um, a lot of the health problems that victims of trafficking have have to do with their living conditions. They have a host of physical and psychological problems stemming from the conditions that they're kept in or they work in. This is a picture from a brothel in Mumbai. And what you basically see is this woman's whole room. That's all that's in the room is the bed. She has her children under the bed while she's working. There is no um, sinks. There is no toilets. There's none of that in these houses. Um, well, you have to be careful when I was working there as you stepped because there'd be rats everywhere. Um, their living conditions can be very poor. And when you have poor living conditions, health-wise, what are you going to see? You're going to see malnutrition, diarrhea, scabies, head lice, typhoid, tuberculosis, <coughs> hepatigo. You'll see a lot of children that are malnourished, and that's going to stunt their growth. I'm going to put up some pictures for you. By the way, the top one's a picture I took in a brothel in Mumbai, and the second one, I'm sorry, top one is Nicaragua, the bottom one is uh, Mumbai, India. Can you tell me from so far what you've had with physical diagnosis? What are you looking at here? If this person came into your emergency room or your clinic? <coughs> Scabies. Scabies. Lice. Pubic lice. Head lice. So a lot of things that you'll see, diseases, just because of the health situation in which the people live. There is a lot of physical abuse of these women, and they wind up with a lot of injuries from that. These are three pictures of girls that have been abused in trafficking situations, but often they won't be touched here. This picture is a little unusual because they're more likely to have burns and scars on their trunk, for example, if you have them get undressed, because the trafficker wants to have a pretty product <coughs> to sell. So he'll tend not to um, attack their face as much in some situation. This is um, two friends of mine down in Nicaragua. And um, you can see they're both missing their front teeth. And that's because dental injuries are common. And people have their teeth knocked out um, in trafficking situations. This is another friend of mine, Maya, down in um, Nicaragua. She was being trafficked. And she had a daughter. And her daughter got to be 11. And her pimp uh, was very drunk. And he um, took her daughter and tied her up and raped her. And Maya said, that's it. No more. I don't want you raping my daughter. I don't want you touching my daughter. And so he took a machete, and he chopped off her arm, and he chopped up her face, and he chopped up. I'm, I'm really very surprised that she's alive when you realize the injuries that this woman has. 
because he got angry when she tried to protect her daughter. So they can have horrendous, come in with horrendous trauma to your emergency rooms. Um, in one survey on trafficked victims, 92% had significant physical trauma. It's estimated that two and a half million prostituted children are physically assaulted every year. And so that is almost 7,000 murders that happen of children that are um, abused. Another thing you may see in a trafficked person is a tattoo. It's common for them to have tattoos on because they are property. You may also see a lot of traumatic brain injury because of head trauma. And remember, that's going to affect their memory. That's going to affect them trying to give you a history. What do you see here? A sexually transmitted disease, probably. Hepatitis, right. A lot of sexually transmitted infections, like are listed here. And the things that influence the amount of sexual infections is the degree of partners. Some women have as many as 40 to 50 partners in a day. Um, condom use, of course, will, eliminate, will decrease the number of STDs or STIs, but many women don't use condoms. They don't use them for two reasons. One, they have no ability to negotiate condom use with the John. They have no control over the situation. But secondly, other women will choose not to use a condom because if they don't use a condom, the man will pay them more. And if they get paid more, they can feed their children better. Um, Coitus during menstruation, I have down because you know the phrase 24-7. That <coughs> phrase comes from the trafficking industry. These young women are available 24-7, seven days a week, every day of the month. HIV AIDS, obviously a risk for trafficked people. You may see uh, symptoms of that. What about this one? It's a very painful condition. Some people can't even urinate when they have this. Do you know what it is? Herpes. And condyloma and molluscum. Here, this is some condyloma on a tongue. And that actually, the lesion on the tongue on the right, that's a lesion of secondary syphilis. This uh, discharge, these uh, adhesions on the liver, these are all late complications of gonorrhea that we may not see um, in this country, uh, you know, in someone who's not in this situation who gets early care. Um, this is the disease formerly known as Reiter's syndrome, where they get an iritis and they get arthritis. And again, um, this is left over from a chlamydia infection that's gone untreated. Here's, here's syphilis. Here's syphilis, secondary syphilis. Again, so secondary syphilis. And here is congenital syphilis. And that's something to keep in mind because we were working in an area where um, we screened and they'd never been screened for syphilis before. And we suddenly, three of the first 10 people we screened were positive. So we had a lot of syphilis to take care of. And then we realized, oh my goodness, we don't know how long they've had it. Their children were probably exposed when they were pregnant. And so then the children had to all be screened for syphilis. This is tertiary syphilis. Let me go on to pregnancy um, with trafficking. And the consequences of pregnancy, this is a Lancet study where they thought that, uh, I know some of you have class, so I'm not taking it personally that you're leaving. Um, there's a lot of maternal deaths and abortion related complications that you can see to trafficking. And Abortion complications um, can be like you see here, or there can be late consequences that affect the rest of a person's life. Here's some other long-term consequences you see. People often come in, uh, this is a study done on women within the first 10 days they were rescued, and that what they complain about is headache, memory issues, back pain, fatigue. Very nondescript. There's not a symptom somebody's going to give you it, come in and you could say, oh, you must be sex trafficked. There's a lot of mental health consequences, and these tend not to go away with your antibiotic or your other treatment. Um, here's a list of some of the ones you tend to see. And 
the younger a child is uh, trafficked, the greater her mind-body dissociation and the more dissociative states that you find in them, the more learning disorders and things that will affect them going to school. And remember, it's not just the gal going, it's not just the kid that's being trafficked, but it's the child of the <coughs> woman being trafficked who may not be trafficked themselves, but they watch their mom going through all this. And they are often abused by the trafficker because that's how he keeps the mom controlled. Flashbacks, very common, and substance abuse, very common, because for two reasons. One, the trafficker wants to control the woman, so if he can get her addicted to something, it's great, because then she's dependent on him for staying with the substance. Second, she uses it to try to soothe herself, because their lives are a living nightmare. I put on this picture just to wrap this up, uh, this section, because um, pictures say a thousand words. And <clears throat> these are two girls, one from Florida and one from Colorado, before trafficking and after trafficking. They have a huge effect on people's lives. Let me just um, go through a couple things quickly to show, tell you. One, you're not going to come in like a knight on a white horse for a trafficked person and get them free and be the big hero. They often don't want your help. They are often very afraid to get away from the trafficker. They're a very complex group because they're, they're afraid of the trafficker, and yet often that's the only person who's ever fed and, and clothed and taken care of them. This is a gal who's been trafficked. Just make sure you, you're paying as much attention as you can, because sometimes these, these girls are, are going through very difficult times and you would never know. And they want to speak up, but they're too scared. I didn't really feel safe talking about it because for me in the medical the medical field there's always whenever there's anything that's remotely criminal there's always police involved and I don't have good experiences with the police as long as she feels safe and she knows she's not going to get in any trouble you can have her speak about a lot if if I was just been able to feel safe and comfortable I think I would have spoke out we talked about Bruce and him being with Jill constantly. Um, that's a problem for people accompanying trafficked people. And they're not very good at giving a history. That's another sign you have. They don't know where they are. Their history changes. The pieces don't fit together. some tips that um, doctors and care providers should uh, look for when identifying a sleep sick victim or a human trafficking victim. It's like uh, coming in at 4 or 6 o'clock in the morning with no clothes on, tattoos, um, like in the neck area, lower back area, things that say like daddies or um, initials, um, bottom, looking pale, sick, like she hasn't slept in a couple of days. Or so she's with uh, a male, a guy, and she refers to him as daddy, and obviously he's not. I remember that she can tell she's very persistent, persistent on her. Like, she cannot make a move, or he's right behind her. Or she keeps she looking, at, looking at him for his approval. Like, or she has her head down. Really and then the on the face. face, like certain areas, like, that, you know. There shouldn't be black and bruised like like, like on the chest. she didn't hurt yeah. herself. But a girl who's in the life doesn't look fine. She doesn't look healthy. She has bags. She's skinny. Or like even if like she's like a big girl, you can tell that she hasn't been eating. Like she's her skin looks pale. These are all women who have been rescued for trafficking. Speaking what are they wearing when they come to the hospital? Like if it's winter and it's snow on the ground, they're coming in the hospital with um, open toe shoes and a minister with no socks, no clothes, or even just a sex trafficking. And they're trying to tell you, as healthcare professionals, what you should be looking for and what you might see. Um, just another general list of identifiers. Um, and you have to get that person, like Bruce, away before you ask any questions or go any further. Last time that I went to the doctor to be treated, he was there. Like, who 
was to say that you, you didn't ask him if you didn't ask me if I wanted him to step out the room. I, I just feel like there's a better way that they can do that. She can say, um, um, you know, I need to speak to her for a minute, or um, we need her to sign papers, or, or let's take her for x or something. There's something that can be said, yeah. because domestic violence is a huge issue. They put me in a room, and he was in there with me. And that's what I was about, like, what I was saying from the beginning. Like, I didn't appreciate the fact that he was there. He was there throughout the whole thing, because he was making sure, like, what I was saying to them was, you know, because right. he was flipping, I guess because I don't know if they were scared of him because he was flipping out on us and she, once they moved into the room, she was offering him a seat. Like she offered him a seat before she even offered me a seat. You, if you're suspicious, if you think this person may be trafficked, you can start asking them questions. What are your working or living conditions like? Where do you sleep and eat? Do you have to have permission? To go to the bathroom, is, your, is there a lock on your door that you can't get out? Have you been asked to have sex with multiple men each night? Do you have to reach a quote of money before you're safe to go home? There's all sorts of questions that you can use to pull out more information. If I was a doctor and I'd be asking questions, um, my first question would be, are you okay? It, it seems like a dumb question, and uh, or just simple, but sometimes it it can make you break down and really think about it. Because if somebody would ask me if I'm not okay, I would have actually broke down. There is so much that you can do. If you suspect that someone's been a victim of human trafficking, you've got to get some information so that you're able to find this person's later later. You have to be able to gain their trust. They don't, you don't want them to think you're going to call the police on them and get them arrested, which happens in some places. And to be able to do this, you've got to do your homework before the person comes in. Because they're, once they're sitting in front of you, you don't have time to start investigating and saying, who can I call in Minneapolis that's going to know um, what to do about this person? Some places you may wind up in, you may not have well-trained law enforcement. You do here in St. Paul and Minneapolis. They're not going to come arrest that girl, but in many places they are. Um, so you've got to know what you have for resources, and here is what you can do to get information right away. This is an easy number, 888-3737-888. Can you say that? 888-3737-888. That's a national Polaris hotline. If you call them and you tell them where they're located, they will tell you what the resources are in your area to try to work with um, trafficked women. You need to develop a protocol for your emergency room, for your um, reproductive health clinic, for your urgent care, for your office, so that You've got people that know what to do when these people come in. Because the last thing you want to do is put that person or you or your staff in a dangerous situation. So you have to have everybody trained right from the beginning. And I just want to throw one more comment in. I've talked a lot about girls and women because more than 75% of trafficked sex victims are girls and women. But boys are trafficked. Men are tra trafficked. Transgender men, homosexual men, are very at risk for trafficking. Or gay for pay men, men who are really homo uh, heterosexual, but to earn money will act as if they are homosexual. So th there are women pimps. There are women johns. So we can't be totally gender specific here. We have to keep our eyes wide open. This is a picture from the brothel in Kanthampur in India that I worked in. And um, it bothered me a lot because here's somebody with this terrible trauma, probably shot or stabbed and now being robbed. And people are just sit there and they're not really doing anything or paying attention. And I think you hear stories like Jill and you think, well, didn't anybody care? Why didn't anybody 
get a mental health consult? Why didn't anybody call the police? Why this couple in their Cadillac just look on? I think that the reason a lot of people don't do anything is not that they don't care. I think it's that they don't know and they don't understand. And they have to be aware that trafficking is an issue. And now you're aware because you've been here and you've heard about it. And that's the first step of action and it also empowers you. But now you have a responsibility. And this awareness starts with you. So let me close just as Dr. Seuss says, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not.